Please give it a couple minutes, couple. My friends, we are recording. Today is November 5, and this is the workshop after the amazing program we had. Great big hello and welcome to the Zoo Lab and Trust for Sustainable Living Climate and Nature lesson. My name is Georgie Jeffries and I am from Zoo Lab. And alongside me shortly, you will see my colleague Kirsty Shakespeare. And Kirsty is from the Trust for Sustainable Living. I also need to say a big hello and thank you to Eva, who is helping us with our technical, uh, anything technical today. So today we're going to tell you all about the climate. First of all, how are you, Kirsty? Sorry, I wasn't ready. <laughs> I'm very good, thank you. I've had a fantastic morning. I'm feeling really inspired by the amazing ideas that our students shared earlier on this morning at our kids' mini climate cop uh, with their solutions that they put forward to our world leaders. Um, so yeah, feeling really inspired. Great stuff, I agree. Very articulate students. And it was great to have representatives from 15 countries who have a great understanding actually of climate science. And it was great to see them develop over this last month as well. So I felt very privileged to be amongst so many knowledgeable focused students. And now it's our turn to present an understanding of the climate and nature crisis. Okay, so Kirsty, let's start off with a question. What is the climate crisis? That's a really important question, Georgie. So the atmosphere of our planet is currently increasing in temperature, which is happening at a faster than normal rate. And that means that our environment and the plants and animals that live in it can't keep up with this rate of change. So since the industrial revolution, um, when we've been burning fossil fuels to power our homes, uh, to provide heat and energy for businesses and transport as well, um, we've had an increase in the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, which are causing the warming of our atmosphere. So since records began in 1880, our global temperature so far has raised by 1.2 degrees Celsius. And scientists have said that if we reach an increase of two degrees, we're at what they're calling a tipping point, which means we may not be able to recover from the impacts that we're seeing. The current pledges that world leaders have committed to prior to the COP26 event that's currently happening would mean that we would be reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to about 2.6, sorry, 2.7 degrees above the 1880 temperatures uh, by 2000 and uh, 2100. So not very ambitious targets and that takes us above the current tipping point that's being suggested by scientists. Mm. Very so, concerning isn't it? It is yeah so should we find out a bit more about greenhouse gases Georgie? Yeah let's talk about greenhouse gases so what are they first of all? Well greenhouse gases are the gases in the earth's atmosphere that trap the heat. They let sunlight pass through the atmosphere but then they prevent the heat that the sun brings from leaving the atmosphere. So overall greenhouse gases are a good thing Without them, our planet would be far too cold for us to exist. And life as we know it, well, it wouldn't exist, but there can be too much of a good thing. Scientists are worried that human activities are added too much of these gases to the atmosphere. Now we've all heard of carbon dioxide or CO2 as we know it. That's something we hear bounced about a lot in the media and we're aware of what it is, but there's a, there are other greenhouse gases as well. The main greenhouse gases actually are water vapor now that might sound quite strange. Carbon dioxide, we know about that one, methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons as well. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about those, Kirsty? <laughs> there were some <laughs> big words in there. Absolutely, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so the ozone layer obviously is the layer of ozone in our atmosphere that we hear a lot about, which is what is keeping these greenhouse gases in. But that plays an important role also in blocking out the sun's radiation, which helps to protect us, us and our environment from the powerful UV rays of the sun. Uh, water vapour, which obviously is water in gas form, so like steam from a boiling pot or kettle, forms in clouds and then rains back down on the earth. But this water vapour blocks heat from escaping so it gets warmer, which makes even more water vapour. So that is a sort of continuing cycle. Carbon dioxide is everywhere around us. It comes from our respiration processes. Uh, it also comes from decaying organisms as things rot. And also volcanoes release carbon dioxide as well. Um, and the main issue that we've got is that it's being released in huge amounts when we burn fossil fuels like coal and oil. Um, and it's the main contributor to human caused global warming. Methane, I think, is Georgie's favourite. She likes talking about this one. This is a gas released by cows and all animals when they fart. <laughs> it's particularly, <Yay>. particularly <laughs> smelly, um, but it's also released by wetlands uh, and their ecological processes. Uh, the rice growing process releases methane. And it's also released uh, when we coal mine as well. So it traps a lot of heat and it's the second highest contributor to global warming. Nitrous oxide uh, is created naturally by bacteria in the soil and it's also produced in our oceans. Um, manufacturers can produce it in factories and it's used in power plants and fertilizers as well. Um, and that damages the ozone layer, which is the, one of the layers that's helping to protect us from those harmful UV rays. Um, and it's quite an important, powerful uh, greenhouse gas. And chlorofluorocarbons that you mentioned earlier on uh, aren't natural in their environment. They're a man-made gas um, that were used in the early or late 1900s. I think it was banned in the late 70s or early 80s. Um, it was used as a cooling agent in refrigeration systems and freezers and also as in um, aerosol cans um, as a propellant. Uh, but that was found to be damaging the ozone layer. And actually, that was what started um, a lot of the looking at the environment and how it's affecting the climate and our ozone layer, because that was what was causing some of the big holes in our ozone layer originally. So other than holes in the ozone layer, what impacts do greenhouse gases have, Georgie? Well, the increase in greenhouse gases means that there's more heat being trapped inside, causing an increase in the temperature. And this has an effect on all our natural world systems. Firstly, we've got the ice caps melting. The ice reflects the sun back away from the earth, preventing it from heating up. It gives a temperature balance. However, an increase in temperature will mean that the ice melts, decreasing the size of the ice caps and producing what we call a positive feedback loop, as this then speeds up the process of the ice melting, which in turn causes global sea levels to rise. This will be catastrophic for island and coastal towns all over the world because it will affect businesses and jobs along the coasts as well as houses. It will mean that populations around those areas will need to move further inland, which will increase the population in cities as well. The polluted air will cause health problems and respiratory issues in all species. This increase in temperature will also affect the weather systems, ocean currents and water cycles. There'll be floods and storms there could be fires and droughts, which will affect water availability, and the dry soil and habitat will be problematic in farming, with little food production causing food shortages too. These factors will affect biodiversity. Now, if you're not sure what biodiversity is, biodiversity, by the way, is another way of saying wildlife. So all the different species on our planet. Biodiversity allows us to cope with the changing world from the air that we breathe, clean water, weather patterns, a healthy climate and the food that we eat all rely on stable ecosystems with multiple species able to support each role. The loss of any species is devastating. However, the decline or extinction of one species can trigger an avalanche within an ecosystem. What I mean by that is a knock on effect, wiping out many other species in the process that are part of that food chain. When biodiversity losses occur, the knock-on effect can affect species within a region. They can eliminate potentially data deficient species. So what I mean by that, Kirsty, is species that we perhaps don't even know that exist. We might not have even discovered them yet. Places like the rainforests, where we know there's so many species still yet to be discovered. A study carried out last year in a protected area near Acope in Panama documents how snake 
the snake community, so the number of snake species plummeted, declined in number after an invasive fungal pathogen wiped out most of the frogs in that area. Those frogs were a primary food source to the snake species. And of course that had a knock on effect. And this is a species that we know about. What about the millions that we don't that are in decline, perhaps due to climate increase? Let's remember there are 1.3 million species recorded on our planet, catalogued by scientists, but they think there could be up to 8.7 million species on our planet. Another great example, actually, which you reminded me about the other day, Kirsty, about our knock on effect was sea otters. So when sea otters are hunted, sea otters will feed off of sea urchins. And if the sea otters are being hunted and they decline in number, that's going to mean an increase in sea urchins, which is going to be an increase in feeding off kelp. So seaweed, which fish hide in. So if there's not enough kelp for the fish to then hide in, the knock on effect of that has been that there's been a lot less fish stocks for our fishermen out there and for bio, the point of view for biodiversity as well. So it just goes to show you how the change in one species can have a cascade effect. So it's all linked? All very linked, yeah. So I'm gonna show you a species that lives actually in the forest and then we'll talk about a few of the solutions that perhaps could be implemented. So I'm going to show you a snake species, so very exciting. And it's a forest species that we'd find living in Africa. He's a royal python and his name is Hunter. Don't be alarmed by the name. Okay, he's really friendly, I promise. And I'm behind the screen anyway, so it's all good. So he's called Hunter uh, and he's pretty nice. He will keep sticking out his tongue and he's not being rude. He's just having a good old smell of you lot out there, okay? Here's a question while I get him ready. Let's see if any of our people watching know the answer to this. Does a snake have a backbone? Here's the thing, does a snake have a backbone? have bones inside it now because of the way I've got the screen I can't actually see the chat so if you see anyone reply Kirsty, if you can just let me know that would be great so this is Hunter now he does keep sticking out his tongue look there we go and if we look closely there are prongs on his tongue you can see it goes in two directions there we go now a bit like we've got two nostrils we can smell left and right, of course. He's got two prongs, which help him to smell left and right. He just likes to be different. He just does it a little bit different to us, that's all. Now look at this fabulous colouring. This fabulous colouring helps to break up his outline. Now, if he was one solid colour, if he was say bright yellow, for example, he's gonna really stand out in that forest. But because he's patterned, if you were trekking through the forest and if you weren't really looking for him, you can't see his outline very well. He's going to get hidden amongst leaf litter and leaves on the trees and bark and vines. You're going to struggle to see him. So that's a great way of camouflaging. We got anything in our chat about whether we think he's a vertebrate or an invertebrate? We haven't yet, no. Nothing yet. We get, okay, well, get, we get some answers through. But I can, vouch, I can vouch for amazing snake camouflage. I, for my master's degree, was helping some PhD students that were looking for snakes and they're so hard to find because they're so amazingly camouflaged. Yeah, absolutely. So. And, you know, this, they don't just live... We tend to think about snakes and just living on the floor, don't we? On the forest floor or on the ground. We don't think that snakes actually can live in trees as well. There's different, lots of different species of snake and there's tree pythons, tree boas. Some tree species are green. So like emerald tree boas. So they look like the leaves on the trees. Um, so some, some are really small and can curl up on a 10 pence piece. That's how small they are. Some are really big. Our biggest one is the reticulated python that can reach over nine meters in some cases. And is about as wide as about this, between this side of my head and my hands here, pretty wide. So yeah, so a huge diversity in our snake species. And you're absolutely right, Kirsty, they're really difficult to find. Some of them are nocturnal, of course, but some will come out during the day. Now, I did notice a reply in the chat from Lalente, actually, who's watching, who was one of our fabulous speakers this morning, actually, in our event. And Lalente has said it's a vertebrate, and you're absolutely right, Lalente, is a vertebrate. So although he doesn't look like it, he's all bendy, he does have a spine, and it goes all the way down his back, right to the end of his tail. If you look closely, you can see a ridge actually in the light there. So that's his spine. And then all down his body are ribs. He's got a rib cage the entire length of his body. 
uh, which goes right to the very end. So he's got over 400 bones. Us humans have got 206. So he's got a lot more bones. How about that? OK, I'm going to pop him back and uh, let's talk about some of those solutions to our uh, forest issues. Make sure he doesn't escape, Georgie. Oh, no, he's all right. He's there. We're all good. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So talking about our biodiversity and protecting it. Well, biodiversity is, of course, everywhere, not just the forests. In the forests, we could talk about deforestation. And actually, from our real COP26, they are pledging to stop deforestation by 2030. Let's just hope that that does happen. More protected areas. So protected areas, including in the oceans as well, to protect species that we know are vulnerable. And more captive breeding programs. So in zoos, zoos can be a really good thing when it comes to conservation because zoos can breed vulnerable species in captivity and then be involved in what we call captive uh, conservation programs so they'll once they've got a stock of them in captivity they can reintroduce them to the wild now the thing with that is is that that conservation area that they're reintroduced to has to be fit for purpose the ecosystem needs to be balanced and you need to work with local people. If you reintroduce a species where the ecosystem is not balanced, what's gonna happen is they're gonna get to that species will get decline in number quite quickly. And local people need to want to support that conservation project as well. So those two things really do go together. So you have to fix the problem before you can release the species. Absolutely. The problem in the wild needs to be fixed. And then once we've got our breeding program uh, and we've got enough of a population in our in our captive breeding program then we can reintroduce them but it must be balanced and it must be fit for purpose okay so supporting local wildlife as well that's something that you can do if you are interested in protecting the environment on a on an individual level well get out there and get to know your local species there are lots of wildlife trusts and things out there you can go along and support them because most of those are charities and you can help support them and, and get to know some more species yourself as well OK, so I've just talked about a royal python that lives in the forest, Kirsty. That leads me on to you, because I think you're going to talk about forests, aren't you? I am. And actually, my local habitat where I live is in a forest. Uh, and I'm really lucky to work at a forest as well. The Trust for Sustainable Living runs a visitor centre, which is an indoor rainforest. So I'm surrounded by tropical and temperate rainforest, which is fantastic because forests are really important habitat. They cover almost a third of the Earth's surface, which is just over 15.3 million square miles. Um, and they're typically split into four categories based on the local climate. So we have our tropical rainforests, which on average are about 28 degrees centigrade a year. They don't usually drop below about 20 degrees centigrade and they're wet. It rains a lot, about two metres a year. So 2,000 millilitres of water a year fall in those rainforests. You have subtropical forests, which are a little bit cooler than our tropical rainforests and a little bit drier. They don't have quite so much rainfall and they have a cooler period, a cooler season in the year. Our temperate rainforests or temperate forests are typically found in Europe and North America, and they experience four seasons. So you have a spring, a summer, an autumn and a winter. And within that period, those trees will often lose their leaves if it's a deciduous forest and you'll have a period of um, torpor where the trees sort of go to sleep for the winter when there's not enough light or heat to keep them photosynthesizing. And finally, our northern and southernmost forests are the boreal forests. So these are the ones that you find along the polar regions of Canada, Russia, uh, northern Europe. Uh, they're usually characterised by coniferous trees that keep their leaves or keep their pins all year round. Um, and the animals here have to be very well adapted to a lot of snow. So this is where you find species like our reindeer um, that live in these cool forests as well. So uh, one of the special types of tropical forests that you get is cloud forest. So my colleague Pete, who's a plant expert here at the Living Rainforest, has done an amazing video for us on cloud forest, which I'm going to ask my colleague to share with you now. So if you can hear the sound on this. Can't hear the sound, Kirsty, actually. Did you hear the sound? Yeah, mostly. How come your phone? Huh? You want to take the chat? 
over no, there. No, we haven't got any sound, I don't think, Kirsty. Okay, one moment. Sorry, guys, we're just trying to sort out the sound. Can you hear the sound okay now? No. No. Kirsty, is the volume of the screen open? Can you check that? Hang on. I'll tell you what, let me come back to the video. I'll get Alex to uh, work on the technical sound issue. And then when it's ready, we can come back to that. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, so anyway, forests are home to about 80% of the world's terrestrial or land-based biodiversity. Uh, globally, 1.6 billion people, which is about a quarter of the world's population, many of whom are also the world's poorest, rely on these forests to provide food, shelter, fuel, and support their livelihoods. Forests are also important as a stabilizing force for the climate. They regulate ecosystems um, and influence rainfall and climate patterns globally. It's estimated that forests provide around 75 to $100 billion worth per year in goods and services, such as clean water and healthy soils. They're also really important because they produce around 50% of the world's oxygen, and they store around twice as much carbon dioxide as they emit which thinking about climate makes them a really important carbon sink. Um, and approximately one third of the carbon dioxide that's released every year from the burning of fossil fuels is absorbed by forests. Unfortunately, we're losing forests at an alarming rate. About 18.7 million hectares of forest every year are being cut down and degraded, mainly in the tropical region. That's the equivalent to one football pitch every two seconds or an area the size of London being lost every week. There are lots of different causes. Some are cleared for cattle ranching and agriculture to grow crops such as soy in South America and palm oil in Asia, uh, while others are illegally harvested for timber. Much of African forests are being uh, at risk for that. But the loss of forest and forest degradation is equally devastating. As the trees are cut down, the ability to store carbon is lost and the carbon that they contain within their leaves and their trunks and their roots is released into the atmosphere. And it's unfortunate that there are now parts of the rainforest in the Amazon that are emitting more carbon dioxide than they store because of the rate that the deforestation is happening. So there's so many trees being cut down and so much habitat being damaged that the actual forest in that area as a whole is releasing more carbon than it's storing. So forests themselves are one of the most important solutions to addressing the effects of climate change. If we can stop that loss of forest and the chopping down of trees, um, we can actually start to uh, reabsorb carbon and they could poten potentially contribute over a third of the total climate change mitigation that scientists have agreed is required by 2030 to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement. So this is why it's so important that our world leaders this week at COP think about protecting forests um, and how we can use forests as a nature-based solution to help reduce the impacts of climate change. Um, so what are the solutions? Well, creating protected areas, only 17% of our global forest has any kind of proper protection at the moment. So developing and creating new protected areas where forests are not able to be logged, either illegally or legally, um, creating greater enforcement of laws around protecting those forest areas as well. Also, recognising the rights of Indigenous people. I mentioned a lot of our poorest and most uh, ruralised communities live in forests. Um, and recognising their right as a local community person to um, use the land ensures that they have uh, good outcomes for the forest. It helps to protect them. It helps to strengthen the community control over the area in which they live. It can help to alleviate poverty. It provides empowerment for men and women. It can help to enhance and protect the biodiversity that you mentioned earlier, and it leads to more sustainably managed forests. So if we can work with more Indigenous people to help them to understand and look after their area um, and give them the right to do that and the responsibility to do that, that's been proven as a really effective way to restore and look after our forests. Uh, another option is forest regeneration, which is basically humans not getting involved and letting the forest uh, and nature take over, letting the trees and the forest naturally regenerate. 
Um, in some cases, depending on the condition of the soil, it might be the case that they need a little bit of help. So they might have to have some trees to start being replanted. But estimates have shown there's an area across the world about the size of South America that offers good opportunities for restoration. So if we can plant forests to the equivalent of the size of South America, that's going to store a huge amount of carbon for us. Um, and another way that people can help directly, if you're thinking about our viewers, uh, lots of people are becoming more conscious consumers and demanding products from the forests that come from sustainable sources. So many of our major palm oil, timber, paper and forest produc production companies are beginning converting to deforestation free supply chains. So supporting palm oil free or sustainably sourced palm oil products, thinking about fair trade, all those kinds of sustainable, sustainably certified products can help to protect our forests as well. So I'll just ask Alex if he's able to share our video again and see if we can get sound. And if not, we'll try and come back to it later. Um, okay. Now forest trees are typically short and crooked. Can you hear that? Climbing ferns, lichens, and epiphytes, such as bromeliads and orchids, form thick blankets on the trunks and branches of the trees. Begonias, ferns, and many other herbaceous plants may grow to a very large size in clearings. Like their temperate counterparts, these forests are densely covered with mosses and lichens. Whilst the angle of elevation of the ground facilitates sunlight to penetrate through to these short plants. The topography of these forests plays a crucial role in defining the microclimates of these beautiful verdant forests. Cloud forests often feature cliffs and steep dramatic shifts in elevation between the highest peaks and the lowest valleys, contributing to the buildup of rainwater and atmospheric moisture. Lowland rainforests, on the other hand, tend to cover large expanses of land with little change in elevation, providing consistent conditions in terms of temperature, humidity and precipitation. Another key difference is the type of rivers that flow through them. The rivers of cloud forests tend to be faster, shallower and clearer with rocky beds, whilst rainforests tend to have larger, slow rivers with heavy silt beds. The moisture from the rivers combined with a higher altitude creates additional condensation that leads to the formation of fog and mist, which help to make these forests so beautiful. Orchids show a wide range of ecological tolerance. In addition to those orchid species found above the Arctic Circle, a few species thrive in desert conditions. The greatest number of orchid species, however, is found in tropical cloud forests, usually on mountainsides, where the clouds brush the trees 24 hours a day. This is a perfect habitat for epiphytic orchids, as well as members of the Araceae family, ferns, and numerous other epiphytic plants. Cloud forests generate water, which is an important contributor to stream flow. They do this by capturing water from fog or surface clouds. Water condenses on the leaves and branches, drips to the forest floor, and then enters the streams. On a regional basis, as forest is cleared for agriculture and other purposes, land use change may cause cloud bases to lift. Moisture entering the atmosphere from transpiration is then lost and cloud formation decreases or moves to higher altitudes. Maintaining forest cover helps ensure cloud forest formation and protects the water supply. Because of their dependency on local climates, cloud forests stand to be among the first to be badly affected by global climate change. Linked to the reduction of atmospheric moisture and increasing temperature, the water cycle in these regions will change and the system may dry out. This would lead to the shrinking and ultimately the death of epiphytes which rely on high humidity. Frogs and lizards are expected to suffer from increased drought. Global warming can result in a higher number of storms which in turn may increase damage to tropical montane cloud forests. The consequence of climate change for tropical cloud forests will result in a loss in biodiversity, altitude shifts in species ranges and community reshuffling, and in some areas, complete loss of cloud forests.
1970, the original extent of cloud forests on the Earth was around 50 million hectares. But population growth, poverty, uncontrolled land use and climate change have all contributed to the loss of cloud forests. The 1990 Global Forest Survey found that 1.1% of tropical mountain and highland forests were lost each year, higher than in any other tropical forests. The survival of cloud forests in the 21st century is under threat, even more so than for other types of rainforest. An estimated one third of all cloud forests on the planet were designated as protected areas by 2004. Satellite imaging used to assess the change in tree cover for all the world's cloud forests demonstrated that globally, just over 2% of cloud forests were lost between 2001 and 2018. In some regions, however, these losses were as great as 8%, with the most significant declines occurring in those regions that were most accessible to people. Thank you for sharing, Alex. So, so as you can see from Pete's video, even the most uh, unique of our rainforest habitats is under threat and at great risk from climate change. So I mentioned that one of the issues, Georgie, that many of our forests are facing is deforestation for cattle ranching. I think that's going to be something you're, you're going to tell us a little bit more about. Yeah, thank you, Kirsty. So beef farming has a severe impact on the rainforest due to deforestation, particularly actually in Brazil. Trees are cut and the land is converted into a pasture for cattle grazing. Meat production contributes heavily to the increases in greenhouse gas emissions. And along with deforestation, there's also soil degradation too. Intensive farming methods, these are using pesticides and chemical fertilizers, are destroying not only useful insects, such as important pollinators that give us our fruit and vegetables, our food, but larger animals such as birds, mammals as well. Insects are characterized by their huge abundance and diversity and in their role as pollinators, decomposers and natural regulators of pests. Insects support our food webs and a healthy environment. Although at the bottom of almost all food webs, the larger feathered and furry animals cannot survive without them as a source of food. Messing with the insect abundance is the last thing that humans should be doing. Yet insect numbers right across the globe are dropping and they are dropping fast. So what are the solutions? Well, organic farming and using natural predators. So we talked earlier on today in our summit about uh, ladybirds uh, being natural and, and birds of prey. Um, sustainable farming solutions. And these are, th these are elements such as crop rotation, crop diversification, and this helps with the soil quality as well. The use of technology and data to ensure good crop yields, but ensuring we're doing a circular effect. This is back to our circular effect, and that is recycling. So crop waste and animal manure. Of course, a ban on deforestation, which we've talked about earlier, and we have this lovely pledge for 2030. We can only hope that that happens. But also, Consumers can consider a change in their diet as well. Meat, because of the effects we've just talked about, meat can be one of the worst things for methane emissions particularly. And this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, about our cow farts, of course. <laughs> now, insects, we talked about pollination, pollinators. Well, I've got an insect to show you today, and there was a real quick glimpse of one in your video, actually, Kirsty. Um, and I've got one that I'm going to show you for real. Actually, I've got quite a few I'm going to show you for real. You see, although cockroaches, we think of them as recyclers, um, they decompose, they break down all the nutrients, they're detritivores, they break down all the nutrients on, on the forest floor or on the cave floor. They've discovered there are 11, there are species that pollinate 11 plant species across the world. And it's considered, they probably, in all honesty, po pollinate a lot more than that. Further studies just need to be done. So oh, I'm going to show you a hissing cockroach, a Madagascan hissing cockroach. So all the way from the island of Madagascar. So we're going to meet either Mike or Melinda and their many offspring. Okay, so let's take a look. Now, what question can I throw at you? Okay, so we should know, let's see how well we know our insect anatomy, shall we? How many body parts does an insect have? 
let's see if we know the answer to that. How many body parts does an insect have? Share your answers in the chat. I can read them out to Georgie while she's handling her cockroaches. Okay, I've had a cockroach explosion, guys. Now, why is that? Well, cockroaches breed incredibly quickly. They're really prolific breeders. They, there's different methods in which they reproduce, they, they uh, lay their eggs depending on the species, but some will bore an egg sac into a piece of wood. And in that egg sac is fi are 50 babies. And they can do that very frequently, very often, okay? So I've just had a cockroach explosion quite recently. So I'm gonna hold this up and show you just what I mean. Whoa, look at that guys. So this is just some of them. Okay, so these are Madagascan hissing cockroaches. Now, oh, you can see all these different sizes. The kind of middle size one, they're what we call sub-adults. They were born a few months back, they hatched out. So there's some really small ones on here. I don't know if you can see those tiny ones. Uh, there's some on this side, actually. You can see those really tiny ones. They're literally weeks old, okay? Now, let's see if we can show you one of the adults up close. It's not gonna run away. Oh, I've got something really exciting to show you in here, actually, before we do. I want you to look we at this one. We can hear them, Georgie. They're making noises. You hear it? Yeah, it, it, she hissed because I just picked her up. She's not very happy with me. So that's one of their characteristics, which is why they're called a, a hissing cockroach. They make that hissing sound. Now, they don't make that hissing sound from where you might think. Uh, we tend to think about them rubbing their legs together or, or, uh, or something similar, rubbing their antennae together. Lelente has answered our question from earlier three body parts, head, thorax, and abdomen. Brilliant, well done, Lalente. Insects have three body parts. But our cockroach hisses the same way in which it breathes. Now, you may not be aware of how insects breathe, but they don't breathe through their mouth and their nose like we do. They breathe through holes all down the sides of their abdomen on either side, and those holes are called spiracles. So they breathe and exchange gases in and out, just like we do into our through our mouth and our nose into our lungs. Now, when they get upset, <laughs> they push air out of those holes to make that sound. And you actually heard it earlier, which is fab. So this is Melinda. Now, how do I know this is Melinda? Because there are no horns on her exoskeleton near the top. You can see it's completely flat. The boys have horns. And believe it or not, the boys will actually fight with each other over space in the cave, over territory, over females, okay? So just like a deer stag would rut, the males will do exactly the same thing. I wanna show you something because I've just discovered in this tank, I want you to take a look at this. Now it's completely white, but it is a Madagascan hissing cockroach. Does anyone know what's happened there? It's not gonna stay white, by the way. Ooh, it's not gonna stay white. So what's just happened to this cockroach? Is that a baby? Uh, it's not a baby. Good try. Oh. It's a sub-adult, so it's it's uh, it's growing. Maybe some change in diet. Not changing diet. No. What do insect? Where are insect skeletons? Where's an insect skeleton? Does it have a skeleton inside it like we do? Is it a vertebrate or is it an invertebrate? Alex has said exoskeleton. Yeah, it's got an exoskeleton. So it's skeletons on the outside of its body. Now think about that. Imagine I was in a sleeping bag. Okay, the sleeping bag's my exoskeleton. Okay, and I eat lots of trifle because I like trifle. And I eat far too much trifle and I get bigger and bigger and bigger. What's eventually going to happen to my sleeping bag? That zip is going to tear. It's going to pop off me because it's just too small. I then will have a slightly bigger sized sleeping bag underneath so that I can eat more trifle, hurrah. I keep eating more trifle and I get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I start to get really tight in that next sleeping bag. Okay, this is what happens when insects grow. They shed their skin, then they grow again, they shed their skin. Now this guy here has literally just shed its skin. And after they've shed their skin, they're pure white. And what will happen in the next about 12 hours, that skin, because this is an exoskeleton, but it's really soft, it will harden and it will turn into that brown colour that you know that the cockroach has. So it's literally just shed its skin and it's quite vulnerable at the moment because it's very, very soft. So there we go. That's our cockroach. Do you want one last look at our, uh, our log again? I'd like to see you make your cockroach noise impression. Would you? I can do that for yeah. you, Kirsty. Of course I can do that for you. Ready? Ooh, we can all do it together. 
yeah yeah exactly so there's holes all down the sides so fabulous so there are cockroaches now in madagascar you would find them living in rainforests and caves and in the cave in the roof of the cave there will be bats if there's lots of bats up there that does mean there's going to be lots of bat guano bat poop on the cave floor and scuttling amongst all that bat guano would be thousands of those cockroaches eating the bat guano so they are recycling they should be great role models to us because they actually clean up all of that rubbish they're detritivores they clean up rubbish you know actually they can eat that wood that they you saw them all sitting on they'll start chewing on that they'll just start chewing away at it there's only four things cockroaches cannot chew through and they're man-made things glass metal plastic and brick any, any natural materials they can chew through and use it as food. So that's why they're still around today. They've been around for millions of years and they haven't really had to change and adapt because they do all right as they are, to be honest. Uh, so that's why they're still here. OK, so in addition to cattle ranching, intensive farming and the effects on biodiversity, the increase in temperature is resulting in dry soil, which has an impact on crop yields across the globe and food availability as well. Underdeveloped countries do not have the access to the technology that developed countries do have. Can you tell us a bit more about that, Kirsty? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Georgie. So I think one of the most challenging topics that our students discussed at our summit this morning was the idea of social justice. Um, so the students very correctly identified, as the UN have, um, the United Nations have said that people who are socially, economically, culturally, politically, institutionally or otherwise marginalized are especially vulnerable to climate change so consequently there's been a growing focus on climate justice which looks at the climate crisis through a human rights lens and the belief that by working together we can create a better future for present and future generations so if you're not familiar with the concept of social justice it's the concept that with fairness in society that people have equal access to money health opportunities, privileges and the basic rights to a uh, standard of healthy diet, clean water, clothing, shelter, shelter education, healthcare, etc. But the climate crisis is threatening millions of people across the world and those societies and climates who are most at risk, such as indigenous people, for example, or those living in developing countries, are facing the brunt of the impacts, often despite having contributed least to greenhouse gas emissions. So you mentioned some of the negative impacts early on of climate change, but in terms of how that affects people and human lives, things such as drought and water shortages, floods and extreme weather, uh, crop failing and food insecurity, reduced agricultural production, uh, low lying islands disappearing under sea levels, uh, increased number of deserts and drying out of our lands, the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services, so the oxygen production and the clean water that our forests provide, and also an increased spread of diseases are some of the different um, impacts of climate change that can directly affect humans. And although these don't exclusively affect poor and developing nations, it does they do have a limited ability to cope with the problems caused by these crises. So for example, if you think about desertification, water shortages and crop failures, crop yields will continue to drop. And while this will eventually affect the richer nations that rely on this food or are buying this food to feed their, their people, um, it's firstly going to affect those countries that are trying to grow that food and often are relying on that to feed their own families and as a source of income to enable them to access what we were talking about in terms of education and healthcare. So you've probably seen on the news this week uh, that Madagascar is on the brink of experiencing it, the world's first climate uh, induced famine. So I've got a little image here. Hopefully you can see that. Oops. Oh, I've moved. Hang on. I've got a little image. Let me see if I can get the right one up. Uh, of Madagascar's rainfall. And you can see, can you see that? Okay. Uh, you can see that we've got this red area is one of the driest areas of uh, Madagascar and they're experiencing terrible droughts in these Kirsty, areas. Sorry yes. to interject. Could you just click on it? We can see all your images, but we can't see it big on your screen. Oh, okay. Let me try again. Let me see if I can open it separately. Sorry, Kirsty. I said you we could see it, but I thought you were going to click on it. So. Yeah. I think I, I was rushing. There you go. Can you see that? Perfect. Thank you. Is it big? Sorry. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can see, so the red areas on here show the driest areas. So Madagascar has had a drought for the last four years, and it's actually the lowest rainfall they've seen in over 40 years. And this is having a huge impact on the amount of crops that they're able to grow because they're not growing. They're trying to plant their crops and there's not enough water for them to grow, uh, which is obviously causing huge problems in terms of food security. So uh, that's causing hunger amongst thousands of people. Um, and obviously, because they're hungry, they're not able to sell those crops, they're not able to make the normal income they would do. That's causing huge problems um, for many people in Madagascar. So this also can contribute further to the climate crisis, because as people try to overcome these challenges, they're often doing so in a way that is increasing their use of unsustainable and environmentally damaging practices. So it might be that uh, in some areas they are trying to burn forest or cut forest down to try and increase the amount of space they've got to grow crops if they're able to grow them it might mean that they're using extra chemicals to try and help those crops to grow which is further polluting the environment and water systems and also because of the lack of finance available many governments in these developing countries aren't able to provide financial to support to reduce poverty or to improve the situation for residents, let alone about investing in the green technologies and sustainable solutions that many developing countries are able to implement and talk about. So small island developing states are another example of a community facing a serious, serious risk from climate change. So we had students joining us earlier on from the Seychelles and the Maldives, which are extremely beautiful, but very low lying islands, um, which are representing uh, the small island developing states and they face a series of unique social economic and environmental challenges um, and for some of these islands actually climate change is one of the greatest threats to their survival uh, they're very influenced by the atmosphere and the oceans um, so our sea level rises are an issue for them there's an increase in monsoons and tropical storms being caused by our warming climate which are having terrible impacts um, so also the populations, agricultural lands and infrastructures are very often on the coastal areas. So this is really quick impacts on these places that we're seeing. Um, the uh, hurricanes in 2017, Harvey, Irma, Maria and Nate were devastating and they destroyed a lot of the communications, energy, transport infrastructure, homes, health facilities and schools in a lot of the small island developing states. As well as that, they're also impacting the biodiversity, which are important for the livelihoods of many people on small island developing states. Uh, industries like tourism and fishery uh, can contribute to over half of the island's income. And if those are damaged because of tropical storms or if people don't want to visit because of the risk of increasing tropical storms, that can have a huge value, a huge impact on the economic value. Um, many species also have aesthetic and spiritual and cultural value for the communities as well. So it can change, can change their culture or impact their cultural abilities if these species are lost. Um, nine of the small island developing states are considered as least economically developed countries, which makes them some of the most vulnerable to the world in climate change. Uh, there's about 65 million people around the world that live on small islands uh, that are considered developing states, and they contribute less than 1% of our global greenhouse gas emissions. So these 65 million people that are contributing less than 1% are actually some of the first people that are seeing impacts. Um, and countries such as the Maldives are actually considering having to move their populations off some of the islands because they're disappearing under sea level. So it's having a huge impact. So what are the solutions for countries like the Maldives and Seychelles? So firstly, provision of financial support. So if we're thinking about social justice and our economies and our nations, we've got a lot of nations that are very wealthy. They've got a lot of access to technology, to research and to expertise and finance, which they can share with our developing nations to try and help to rebalance the scales of justice um, and to provide support. So in Madagascar, looking at water management practices and water management technology would be something that would really help them to reduce the famine. Um, thinking about habitat restoration as well, we mentioned forests and biodiversity earlier on, but Madagascar has lost 90% of its forest in less than 100 years. And as we said, they're really important for maintaining climate and helping to improve water cycles. So if we can restore some of those natural habitats like forests, that will help water management in Madagascar and restoring the coral reefs and mangroves around small island developing states can help protect them from storm surges and erosion that's happening because of sea level rise. 
Uh, also, education is really important. So the small island developing states have got an amazing education program, which they call Sandwatch, which happens across all of the schools and it's run by teachers and local communities. And they work together in the field to monitor their coastal environments. They identify and evaluate any threats uh, and problems or conflicts facing the islands. And then they try and develop sustainable approaches to address them within the islands to try and tackle the problem. So not only does this help to solve the problem, but it also gives people a great greater environmental awareness and gets people thinking um, about how we can solve these and of how we can solve these problems, how we can resolve them and start to care more for about their natural environment. And obviously the main one is burning of fossil fuels. If we can help to reduce globally the amount of fossil fuels we're burning and reduce our global climate, then that's going to help some of these uh, more at-risk communities. Yeah, so thank you, Kirsty. So talking of of, of burning fuels, this is what leads us on to energy, isn't it? So fossil fuel extraction can have a double impact on local and regional animals and plants. Not only does the burning of coal produce greenhouse gases, but the actual extraction itself of the fuel can have a huge impact too, such as the introduction of invasive species, soil erosion, water pollution, and illegal hunting as well. These indirect effects caused largely by road and pipeline construction can be far more damaging and can extend for many kilometers from the mine or well. They can be caused by even small scale extraction. So we mentioned our greenhouse gases earlier. What are the major sources of nitrogen oxide emissions? Well, cars and trucks, coal fired power plants, large industrial operations and ships as well. Well, solutions, of course, would be to switch to renewable resources such as wind, tidal and solar, which will bring green jobs for those currently employed in the fossil fuel industry. To manage and monitor our energy emissions is a huge thing that businesses need to be looking at. An alternative power, so alternative green power for, for ships and aeroplanes, hydrogen power and electric power and any other green alternatives. Last year, actually, there was a hydrogen power boat that created its fuel from seawater. I was thinking that was the first time that had been done. So that was a, a, a great step. Fossil fuels have a huge impact on global warming and climate change. Species adapted to living in an already hot, dry environment cannot evolve quickly enough to adapt further. This can already be seen in the bearded dragon from Australia. These species produce offspring that are what we call temperature gender dependent. So if the eggs are incubated at a slightly higher temperature, females will hatch out. At slightly lower temperature, males will hatch out. Studies that have been done on bearded dragons in certain areas, they've discovered more females are hatching out than males. So already we can predict further down the line that it might be the end of our males in our bearded dragons. And that's again, like we were talking about earlier, just one species. Talking of bearded dragons, of course I have one to show you today. So we're going to meet uh, Puff, actually. Now, Puff is a fairly new addition um, to my animal. I say fairly new addition. I got him in about May last year. So he's been growing an awful lot. He was very small when I got him. He's been growing an awful lot in the last six to seven months. Um, and he's pretty big now. And because he's male, he's quite feisty, can be quite feisty. Um, males and females have quite different temperaments generally in bearded dragons. So here he is. This is Puff. So there we go, this is Puff. Now, bearded dragons, of course, have their name from the fact that their beard here goes black after when they're feeling threatened and stressed. They'll puff it out. They'll make their body here look twice the size, almost like a disc. Puff out this uh, their beard here, puff out the spikes on the side of their head and pretty much do this to frighten away anything that's come too close. Because actually our little bearded dragon here, he doesn't have any venom, although, Many, many years ago, uh, it's thought they did have venom. Um, scientists have found traces of venom in their saliva. So by a trace, I mean, it wouldn't hurt you and I, there's not enough content there now. However, years ago, they would have, would have and used it. So they've lost that in evolution because they don't actually need it. They're quite good at grabbing bugs. They're pretty speedy, can run across that floor, no problem at all. Um, so their method of defense, because they don't have this venom, is to make themselves look big and scary in the hope They'll trick the predator into thinking they're pretty big. So 
what else can I tell you about him? Well, he's got holes in the side of his head and there, of course, his ears, just like you've got holes in the side of your head as well. And he's got this lovely sandy colour because, of course, he lives in a very sandy, hot, dry environment. But remember the impact. All animals evolve, but they can't evolve quickly enough. And our bearded dragons are having more females as offspring than males in the wild. What else can I tell you about him? Kirsty, if, um, how do you think this bearded dragon, what will he do if he sees another bearded dragon? Because they've got no vocalizations, they've got no sound they make. So what would he do if he saw another bearded dragon, do you think? Any ideas? I guess it might depend if it was another male or a female, but might he wave? Yeah, so if it was a male, they tend to do this uh, head bobbing thing. And that's a bit like, okay, I own this territory. And they do this head bobbing until one of them decides, okay, I'm gonna let you have the territory and I'm gonna retreat. But they do a wave too, yes, they do a wave. It's just an acknowledgement and a respect actually. So they'll do this. And actually when he was younger, um, he actually did it to me quite a few times when I used to come to the enclosure. Uh, and it's in slow motion as well. It's like this, it's really slow. It looks so strange. Um, but And I looked it up because I was quite confused why he was doing it to me, but they actually do it to their owners as respect when they're younger, because they're growing up and they, I guess they, they're young and they feel like they can't do anything else. So yeah, he used to, he stopped doing it now though. He's uh, he's much bigger and he's much more powerful and he's uh, he's not prepared to respect me anymore. I don't think You're I'm no longer a threat, Georgie. Or I'm no longer a threat. Yes, exactly that. Uh, so that's Puff and he's pretty speedy as well. So he eats crickets, there we go, and locusts too. Um, so lots of different insects. He eats really large insects as well. So insects this kind of size, which which you would find in the tropics. So Kirsty, we talked about them being uh, their offspring being temperature gender dependent. So I think turtles uh, are the same as well. There's some species of reptile that are, which I guess will lead us into you talking about our to our oceans, won't it? Actually, quite nice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, yeah, so marine turtles often, as Georgie said, also have uh, the gender of their eggs dependent on the temperature at which they hatch. Uh, so thinking about our oceans and our coastal species, coastal seas, so the areas within about 230 kilometres of land, uh, cover many different ecosystems. So we have coral reefs, we have seagrass beds, river estuaries, salt marshes, mangrove forests, and those are home to a lot of species. So although the shallow water in these areas makes up about 10% of the ocean, they're actually home to around 90% of all marine animals. So the vast expanses of ocean that you imagine actually don't host a great amount of life. Uh, most of the, the amazing creatures that we know and love that come from our oceans live on the relatively shallow coastal waters. And a lot of the reason for that is because of the shallow water, uh, the plants are able to grow. So we're able to grow algae, we're able to grow seaweed, sea grasses, which are the base of the food chain for many of the animals like turtles that we know and love. Um, so as well as providing food, obviously they also provide oxygen. So about 50% of the world oxygen actually comes from our oceans. And that's from the plants that are in the oceans that photosynthesize. So that could be our corals, the algae, and also is the phytoplankton. So the really small, really small microscopic plants that a lot of our animals feed on um, help to photosynthesize and create uh, oxygen and also pulling carbon in that process as well. So they're important for storing carbon and also for producing oxygen. Uh, our oceans also suck up or absorb a lot of the heat that's being increased or being admitted into our atmosphere. So 90% of the increased heat associated with emissions from human activity uh, is absorbed by the oceans. And that's meant that the top layers of the ocean have warmed up by over almost half a degree in the last 40 years. Um, so the ocean also affects our climate. The ocean absorbs heat from the sun and those currents move all around the water, uh, around the equator. So I've hopefully got another image. I'll try sharing a picture again with you. Can you see that full screen? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so this shows you the ocean current. So as you can see, we have warm water near the equator that gets warm by the sun. That moves around closer towards the poles. And as that water cools, as it gets closer to the poles, it sinks. And that sinking of cool water and raising of warm water uh, is what drives our ocean currents. So you can see it here, you can see the warm tropical belts and the cooler uh, subpolar currents, okay. Um, so the movement of those, that water is what drives the currents, but obviously as 
our water warms because our climate is warming and that's also warming our uh, oceans more than it should do naturally, that's starting to cause problems. So the cold water that is now becoming warmer is sinking less and which is slowing down potentially those currents. And if those currents stop, that's going to cause problems for places like Europe, which usually have a much milder temperature because they've got warm water currents around them. The other issue is obviously as that water warms, it starts to melt our ice caps, which is going to cause problems because that's going to further increase sea level, uh, which, as we said, is going to be a big problem. So the ocean is great at absorbing carbon dioxide as well as absorbing heat. Uh, the plants that live there absorb about a quarter of the carbon dioxide that we create when we burn our fossil fuels. Um, oceans, plants such as mangroves, uh, algae, and phytoplankton are responsible for producing about 50% of the world's oxygen, but they're also really important habitats. So my colleague Tina, who's our head of animal department at the Living Rainforest, has created a video for us to tell us a little bit more about mangrove habitats, which are one of the coastal forests. Um, and some of the species that live there. So I'm going to ask Alex if he can screen share with us Tina's video on mangroves. We have Atlantic at the can you hear the sound? In total, there are 32 different species. Yes. Oh, now the sound went it's off. It's gone. The sound's gone. We could hear it though. Now it's back. It's the new language. They're able to leave the water and walk, jump, and skip on land. They're still fish, so they'll still need to breathe using their gills. Their gills are adapted to hold water, so they're still able to get the oxygen that they need. Here at the Little Rainforest, we sometimes see them poke their eyes almost into the back of their heads. Here, they're circulating fresh water around their gills. By holding their own water supply, they're then able to move around on the land using their highly adapted front fins and really muscular tail. Because mud skippers are so well adapted to live solely in mangroves, if the mangroves are destroyed, then mud skippers will also perish. But it's not all doom and gloom. Mangroves are able to absorb four times more carbon than landlocked rainforests. They can also help counter the effects of climate change, as they're naturally good water filters, they aid with shore stabilisation, provide coastal protection from storms, and can support fisheries vital to the livelihoods of coastal people. Mangroves have been included in the deforestation net zero pledge that world leaders agreed to last Tuesday. By protecting and restoring mangroves, we will help to protect vital habitat for the highly adapted species that live in them, as well as increasing the amount of carbon removed from the atmosphere to help climate change and for the world to reach its climate change targets. Great, thank you, Alex. So there was some really great footage there of our mudskipper species, which are an incredible fish species, but they're only found in these mangrove habitats. Um, and actually over the last 40 years, our mangrove habitats have declined drastically. So we only have around 35% of original mangrove cover left. So that's declined by over 50% in the last 40 years, more than that, in fact. Um, and as Tina mentioned, they're really important in terms of storing carbon um, and as coastal protection as well. So some of our other favorite marine environments are the coral reefs. Uh, everyone's got, most people I know are finding Nemo fans and part of that is because of the beautiful uh, coral reefs that are depicted within that, the amazing array of species that you find there. But corals are actually very fragile colonies of organisms that build a skeleton around themselves. So it's a type of animal and they live with an algae that uh, they partner with and the algae creates the food using photosynthesis um, and the uh, coral provides a structure for the algae to live in. So they have a symbiotic relationship so the algae shares the food with the coral and in turn the coral gives the algae a safe place to live. They're found in clean, clear, shallow waters and they provide important habitats for other marine species. And about 20% of all our, 25% of all our ocean species live within these coral reefs. But unfortunately, they're also being impacted by climate change in two different ways. The first one is the rising temperatures. So as our ocean water warms, the algae can't photosynthesize if they become too hot. So either the algae die 
or the coral animal spits them out and the relationship is stopped. So that's bad for the algae, it's bad for the coral and the fish. If the coral lose their food source, then they become weak and eventually die. Uh, this is called coral bleaching and you may have seen photographs of it or pictures over the last year, particularly around Australia, 2020 was a very bad year for coral bleaching. Um, and it causes white coral, that's why it's called bleaching, because all the colour from the animal and the plant has been lost because it's just the white skeleton that's left. Another issue that's uh, impacting our coral reefs is increased ocean acidity. So naturally, our ocean has a pH of about eight, which means it's fairly neutral, if not slightly basic or slightly alkaline. However, in the past 100 to 200 years, scientists have observed that our ocean water is becoming about 30% more acidic. This is due to the increased amount of carbon dioxide that our oceans are absorbing. So this increase in carbon dioxide causes our oceans to become more acidic as the carbon from our carbon dioxide forms with, mixes with water and forms carbonic acid. Um, so this can break down the shells of animals that live in the sea. So animals like oysters and shells, shellfish can no longer keep or make their shells. And it also damages the corals and it can cause them to grow more slowly and weaken their skeletal structures. So coral reefs are facing a bit of a tough time at the moment on two different counts uh, as causes of climate change. The other issue I mentioned earlier when thinking about small island developing states and our oceans is looking at sea level rise. So the two main causes of sea level rise are warm water expanding. So as our oceans are warming, they're naturally expanding and getting large in volume and also the melting of our ice sheets. So over the last 25 years, uh, our um, sea levels have increased by over three inches. And that since 1880, when records began, they've increased by over eight inches. So there's been quite a significant increase over the last 100, 200 years of sea level. And obviously that's not the same uh, amount in every place because our oceans aren't flat, they vary in height and size. But globally, the average is around about eight inches of sea level increase. So this can cause lots of problems. It can cause erosion. It can cause wetland flooding. It can contaminate our fresh water supplies that we rely on for drinking. It can contaminate agricultural soil with salt. Uh, it causes habitat loss for fish, birds, plants. Uh, warming waters also increase the amount of hurricanes and typhoons. They move more slowly and they drop more rain and carry more water with them which contribute then to more powerful storm surges that follow those uh, weather events. Already, flooding in low-lying coastal areas is forcing people to migrate to higher ground, um, and millions more are vulnerable from flood risks. So as I mentioned, the Maldives are going underwater because of sea level rise, and they're looking at actually migrating people off the Maldive islands because it's not safe for them. But it's not just small island developing states that are at risk. Globally, eight of the 10 world's 10 largest cities are near coasts and cities such as Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, Hong Kong, Manila, Melbourne, Miami, New Orleans, New York, Rotterdam, Tokyo and Venice. So as you can see, countries across most of, sorry, cities across most of Europe, Asia, uh, America um, are already seeing the impacts of sea level rise, which is threatening basic services such as internet access, transportation systems, because much of the underlying infrastructure is in the path of our rising sea levels. Thank you, Kirsty. Sorry, I was on mute there. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, wow, that's a lot, isn't it? A lot of issues, that's, especially that those islands are facing. Um, so you mentioned transportation at the end there, and um, this is what I'm going to talk about now, actually, is transport. So I mentioned earlier about cars and trucks obviously giving off emissions and the alternative of course are our green options in electric cars but the issue is is the lack of infrastructure in place to support using them often charging can take in some cases several hours and there are not enough points at which to uh, to actually charge them although there have been talks recently of um, putting putting charging points on lamp posts because actually they're very frequent and that, that could be an option moving forward. So that's, there is talk of that occurring. If the commu commuter generally though is work looking to seek for an alternative by using public transport, the monthly cost often currently works out to be more than, than running a car. This means there are more cars on the road. It means there are more roads needed, which lead to habitat loss, fragmentation and biodiversity loss. 
In rainforest alone, this surge in road building is being driven not only by national plans for infrastructure expansion, but by industrial timber, oil, gas and mineral projects in the tropics. The building of roads through rainforests as access to areas for logging, farming and construction does not only cause fragmentation of the forest and habitat loss, but in addition has a direct impact on wildlife through roadkill. More than 3,000 animals die on the country's BR262 highway in Brazil each year. These species can be anything from small species, from frogs right through to monkeys and anteaters. So what are the solutions? Again, protected areas in the forest. But regards the road and crossing the road, wildlife corridors. This is something that is often put in place, even on roads in the UK for species. So this might be an overpass or an underpass at certain points along the road, frequently in the case of the rainforest, to allow the animals to cross in a safe way. Again, this goes back to our ban on deforestation to prevent further highways in conservation areas. A stronger infrastructure to support green transport public transport more affordable and accessible. And further studies carried out with road planning and rail planning using technologies to map out routes avoiding conservation areas. An example of that is our HS2 that we know here in the UK. Although a greener form of transport, it's considered it wouldn't actually be carbon neutral to next century. HS2 will destroy or irreparably damage five internationally protected wildlife sites, 693 local wildlife sites, 108 ancient woodlands, and 33 legally protected sites of special scientific interest. That is according to the most comprehensive survey of its impact on wildlife. HS2 so, is a railway line. Sorry, you didn't HS2 that, is you? a railway, yeah, which is the north of London. Uh, and there's been lots of controversy over it because of, although it's, uh, it's a greener way of travel. It wouldn't be carbon neutral till next century and also the impact on especially biodiversity in ancient woodlands. Uh, so it's been there's been a lot of protests about it as well. So we're, as we're back on talking about forests again, I'm going to show you a forest species, but this one lives really up high in the canopy actually. Uh, and actually for any of you watching that are, have been in our climate summit and you attended our climate rehearsals, you will be very familiar with this little guy that I'm going to show you because you have all been introduced to him before and I always get asked if you can see him again because he's very naughty. Uh, I'm going to show you Jeremy Fisher and he is one of my tree frogs. He's a white tree frog from Daintree Rainforest in Australia and they were a species discovered in the year 1790 way back when and they're not called a white tree frog because they have a white belly they do have a white belly but they're named after the scientist that discovered the species of frog in the first place dr white many species are discovered after characteristics on the animal's body but some are named after the scientists that discovered them in the first place and in the case of this it was dr white so we're going to meet jeremy fisher as you know he's got a lovely smile on his face uh, but he's also very naughty. I'm just going to grab a towel for my keyboard. He will drip on my keyboard otherwise. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to spray my hands with water. It's really important because frogs uh, breathe through their skin. And if I just touch him with dry hands, anything on my hands could go through into his body because that's how he breathes. So it acts like a bit of a barrier between anything on my hands and him keeping him safe. So here he is. This is Jeremy. So <laughs> he's very photogenic, isn't he? He's very photogenic. So look at those great big eyes. I've said to some of you before, uh, he uses his eyes to help him swallow his dinner, as well as helping him see, because he comes out at night time. Um, he's got these great big eyes and he can open up those pupils really big, like a cat would, to enable him to see as get as much light in there as he can to help him see. But he also does this with his eyes when he's pulled an insect into his mouth because he can't swallow here like we can he has to shut his eyes to help him swallow now if you think about it it makes sense because his eyes are big for his head size it would be like me having eyes this size and if I was to roll my eyes and my eyes were that size the pressure of me rolling my eyes with my eyes are that size is going to apply pressure here where the insect is and push it down into my stomach so it makes a lot of sense now this guy lives up high. I'm gonna move my glass of water because yeah, he's gonna jump right in there otherwise. So this little guy lives up high. And if you look at his pads 
on his feet. There you go. You can see how wide they are and they're sticky. And that's what helps him to hold on tight, of course, up high in the canopy layer. And he's got some amazing jumping skills and he can actually <laughs> jump about one and a half, just over one and a half meters. OK, now this little guy is this big. If you're unsure, if you can't picture one and a half meters in your head, look at the door in the room you're in. That's two meters. Halfway up is a meter. So a little about half again is a meter and a half. That's a long way. Excuse me. That's a long way when you're this size. OK, so. Look at these back legs. That's how he can jump. Look at those muscly back legs. That's how he's able to jump so far. Fabulous jumping back legs. So he eats insects, of course. He eats insects. He can eat some pretty big insects. Um, he can eat, I give him sometimes really large Morio mealworms. He eats ones like that as well. These guys are great at mistaking your finger for a worm. And then even though you pull it away, won't let go. Uh, and they'll continue to follow your finger, determine that they can swallow your hand. Uh, and they certainly give up a fight. So they're, they're really good at that. And it's, it's quite entertaining having a game of tug of war with them sometimes. Um, but these are really popular uh, as pets, actually. These guys uh, very, very popular as pets, but now, of course, protected in the wild uh, and can't be taken from the wild. They are um, as pets. They're reared in captivity when people have these as pets really really important because of course we live in a very different world than we used to um years ago people used to go to areas in the world take animals as collectors in fact david attenborough used to be a collector of animals many many years ago that's what he used to do but he was doing what was okay to do at the time but now we are very much protected and we don't take animals from the wild uh, so it's a very different uh, world that we're living now uh, of protecting our habitats and our species as well so that's jeremy i'm going to leave you with that lovely smile i have a question georgie i understand frogs are indicator species for environments can you tell us a bit about what that means yeah so it's, it's good about a healthy an indicator species means a species that gives gives an indicator of the ecosystem as to whether it's healthy now this goes back a little bit actually we were talking earlier do you remember i was talking about the snake species that was wiped out in El Cope and panama because the frogs uh were in decline frogs are at that part in the food chain where because they eat insects and then animals eat those such as snakes and, and maybe bigger monkeys that kind of thing they're kind of right in the middle so if we've suddenly got an, an ecosystem with no frogs in that can have quite a knock-on effect to other species uh certainly above that food chain so that's why they're a good indicator species. Um, not only that, they're in the wild, there's a fungal pathogen called chytrid, which can wipe out frogs in the tropics. So if there's a good frog population anywhere, it's also a healthy environment. We know that's not there because frogs obviously spend their time in water. So not only is it an indicator of the species that are living in that ecosystem, but of the water quality as well, because if the water quality is not good, our frogs are not going to exist in that environment either. So that's what we mean by an indicator species. Great, I'll pop him back. There we go. I'll pop him back. Uh, all of these solutions, of course, um, that we talked about earlier, all of these boil down to business and finance decisions, which is what leads me on to your topic, Kirsty. You're going to be talking about business and finance. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Georgie. So the Global Climate Change Committee have said that we need to spend £50 billion per year for the next 30 years to meet our current climate change targets. That's a lot of money. Um, research has shown that businesses are more dependent on nature than previously thought, with around 44 trillion US dollars of economic value generation moderately or highly dependent on nature. So that's over 50% of the global gross domestic product is directly or highly dependent on nature um, and having healthy natural ecosystems. So construction, agriculture, food and beverages are the largest uh, nature dependent industries. Um, and between those industries alone, they've got an economic value roughly twice the size of Germany's economy. Uh, so lots of industries very dependent. But these fast growing economies have been built on the back of goods and services which have been powered by fossil fuels, harvesting using unsustainable practices, showing poor resource management and little consideration for our environment. This has resulted in the social injustices that we've seen, habitat destruction on our land and oceans, as well as impacting our climate through the burning of fossil fuels. 
But there is a potential win-win-win for nature, climate, people and the economy. If businesses and economic, economic actors can respond with urgency to protect and restore nature and start identifying, assessing, mitigating um, potentially severe consequences which were impacting our climate. All businesses need to commit to using the most sustainable practices possible to minimise their environment and environmental impacts and they need to be held accountable for these environmentally responsible actions. And the more developed nations need to support the less economically developed nations in being able to develop more sustainable in the most sustainable way possible by providing financial support as well as technology and expertise. So at the G20 summit, which happened in July and at the COP26 summit happening at the moment, governments are committing to continue and increase their efforts to address the triple crisis of climate change, nature loss and pollution. Finance, both green and blue, which I'll explain in a minute, are on the agenda. And ministers have highlighted the urgent need to direct financial flow and mobilise financial resources to align with biodiversity, ocean, land degradation and climate targets. Um, for the UN, green financing plays an important role in delivering several of the sustainable development goals. And they have an environment team already working with public and private sector organisations to attempt to align our international finance and banking systems to the sustainable development agenda. So green finance, which I mentioned earlier is one of our solutions, is any structured financial activity, product or service that's been created to ensure a better environmental outcome. It can include investments that are used to encourage the development of green projects or to minimise the impact on the climate of more regular projects or a combination of both. So projects that might fall under the green finance umbrella would be renewable energy and energy efficiency, looking at pollution prevention and control, thinking about biodiversity conservation, circular economy initiatives like we spoke about this morning where companies have to think of the full life cycle of their product and make sure that it's recyclable or reusable and isn't just a single use item that's thrown away into landfill afterwards. And also looking at the sustainable use of natural resources and the land. Um, the summits are also addressing the health of our oceans and seas, reflecting on the threat they are under due to climate change um, with ministers calling for action taken to conserve, protect and restore and sustainably use the seas, oceans and our marine resources. And with major industries such as shipping, fishing, aquaculture and coastal tourism dependent on ocean health, the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Initiative, which is again run by the UN, um, is a community focused initiative looking at private finance and ocean health working across the financial community to provide guidance and frameworks to ensure that investments, underwriting and lending activities align with the UN Sustainable Development Goal 14, which is life underwater, enabling financial institutions to rebuild ocean prosperity, restore biodiversity and regenerate ocean health. So if businesses are able to change their practices and if we're able to invest in green and blue finance options and solutions to help restore our oceans and our habitats, um, and we're able to do that to enable the developing nations to um, improve their sustainability practices as well. Hopefully, everyone will be able to move towards a more sustainable future, become much less reliant on and hopefully eliminate the need for fossil fuels. And we can start to reverse the climate crisis that we've been talking about. So we hope that you found our climate and nature lesson interesting today. If you've been inspired by the session and would like to learn more, please get in touch with George or I through TSL or Zoolab. We've got plenty of resources we can share with you. Um, and in the meantime, there's some actions we think we could share with you. Obviously, you have some individual choices and consumer availability. Um, so if you are able to think about your personal choices and be a conscious consumer, so think about buying some products that are from sustainably sourced uh, companies, so thinking about fair trade or palm oil free or sustainably sourced palm oil, the uh, Forestry Stewardship Council do certified wood products, paper products. So thinking about what you buy, where that comes from, buying locally produced foods to reduce your food mile and the carbon that's emitted um, in transporting our food around, buying locally. Um, as an adult, thinking about your energy supply and whether that comes from renewable energies or whether you're getting your energies from providers that are still using fossil fuels and changing that and driving consumer change. Uh, also where your money is invested, your bank investments, your retirement plans, 
uh, which might be a little bit out of the, the thoughts of some of our younger viewers, but some for us adults, um, actually where your money is invested and if it's invested in these green and blue finance solutions, then that can be really helpful because you're not funding some of the more environmentally damaging practices. Um, looking at green transport options, being environmentally friendly where you can and walking or cycling more, it's great for your health, it's great for your well-being, but it's great for the environment. Um, learning more about your local species, wildlife and protected areas and engaging with the nature that's around you to help you learn to understand it and help to build that love and passion for the environment. Um, and thinking about your time at home, at school, being energy conscious, so switching things off when you're not using them, making sure you turn the taps off when you're brushing your teeth, um, you know, using the, the small flush on your toilet rather than the big flush, all the different changes that you can make as an individual that can help to impact and reduce our uh, climate emissions are going to help to uh, reduce the climate crisis that we're in and that's ways that you as an individual can help along with some of our bigger solutions which we hope the governments are going to be talking about at the COP26 summit. Back to you Georgie. Thank you Kirsty. Uh, I, I don't know how quite I can follow your ending there. That was uh, pretty much summed up everything that I was going to say. So yes, oh, we. I think there's a there's always a feel that the little thing, changes and things that we do at home aren't going to make a difference um, but it is about us all collectively working together and um, individually making those changes and and having a bit of a social responsibility because actually if we all did that that will have an impact um, so if anybody does want to know any more then please do as Kirsty said get in touch um, we can send you some links and, and give you some advice on changes that you can make uh, as well but thank you very much for watching um, that's the end of our collaboration with Zulab and TSL it's been a great event today um, you can watch if you didn't see this morning you can watch again our uh, kids climate cop summit that happened this morning that you can watch that on either the zoo lab facebook page or the tsl the trust for sustainable living facebook page as well uh, and i'm hoping that we can uh, do further events in the future kirsty as well uh, and we'll have more to come soon hopefully have we got Great time stuff. to see if there's any questions from anyone watching that wants yeah, to ask have a look. Anything? Anyone's got any questions they want to share with us? I just really, I just really enjoy the session, the talk, and the sharing the cute um the insects, animals that you shared, and it helped me to think about what I can do with um, my current project. Um, we are trying to provide some resources for like prime elementary school teachers. Mm -hmm. how they can introduce the concepts or some a concept of climate change, natural disasters, or introduce some protocols um, into the classroom. So it helps me think about those. Uh, so thanks a lot for sharing. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, there, there will be further, um, that was announced this morning that there'll be a lot more in the curriculum for next year on climate. Um, so there'll be a lot more that we all like need to be working, uh, educators everywhere will need to be working towards, but I'm, I'm really glad if we've given you some ideas, we can send you further links if you want to leave your um, private message with your email, um, we can send you further links with anything that might help you in class as well. That'd be awesome. Um, can I type that in the chat right now? Of course you can, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay. So, Lalente, have you got a question you want to ask us? I just wanted to say I loved today's lesson. I learned a lot about animals and, and forests and oceans too. Good. I'm so glad. We learned a lot from you this morning as well. So yeah. it's nice to have a two-way learning between our students and our teachers. <laughs> yeah. Have you enjoyed the journey, Lalente? Have you enjoyed this? It's been about a month, hasn't it, that we've been doing these rehearsals. And have you enjoyed it? Yeah, I loved it all of the rehearsals and I loved and I loved today's um cop summit for children great stuff well done you well you were an integral part of that so you should be very proud of yourself well done you <laughs> thank you can thank I come you. in too Goodbye. yeah go for it Eva <laughs> so friends uh it has been a pleasure to study just like Lalenta said we all enjoyed the uh practices prep meetings it, it it took a lot of work to really study and uh, get together because none of the 
none of these participants, they knew each other. They don't know each other. They don't even live on the same country. So mm -hmm. it was a big teamwork of young adults, teenagers who never met before, but they had one big goal of witnessing a climate change. So I think that was a big powerful thing because we all want to do something we all see something is happening we all want to do something and this was that something so i appreciate every moment every meeting and on the other hand kirsty and georgie i so enjoyed working with you and we we all know we all do different things but working on climate change with young adults like this i think we can say that was so fun and super satisfying mm -hmm. and in the future i am hoping more people more adults more educators or coaches around the world will discover the value and the joy of talking to young people especially about climate change and sustainability mm -hmm. so it has been my pleasure to really uh wake up so early in the morning or try to <laughs> try, to, under <laughs> try <laughs> to understand the time zones and all that. And it was just like, so it gives us, I think it gives us hope to mm -hmm. know that young adults are interested. Kirsty, all your teachings, amazing. Mm -hmm. And you. Georgie, Georgie, your teachings plus your friends, they were just <laughs> like, and I have a question before we finish up. I am curious about your own habitat because you have been sharing all these <laughs> insects or animals. Like, are you in your home office? Am I in, in a cave, cave or where am I? Yeah. Where, <laughs> where, where, are, where are you, Georgie? I had to ask that, but I think it will be insightful if you tell us what you do. Um, yeah, sure. So I, uh, it looks like I'm in the rainforest, doesn't it? And uh, oh, I wish I was uh, with all these wonderful species. But uh, I live in a place called Wiltshire in the UK. So I live in a in a suburb. Um, so I have a room that um, is converted into so it's an animal room where all these animals are. So it's very warm in here because the majority of the animals are actually cold blooded. So they need at least a sort of a base heat of 22, 23 degrees. So it's very warm in this room which is why you see me drinking so much water ever when I'm here all the time when I'm doing my sessions um, but my job with Zoolab and what Zoolab do is that we take our animals to schools primary and secondary and universities actually and we do a variety of topics linked with the curriculum um, for anything from mini beasts to bio mimetics, biomimicry, uh, adaptations, human impacts on the environment, invasive species so um, climate climate now yes we've got uh, three climate workshops that fit all age range a storytelling one uh eco investigation and now a climate time machine which is actually what one of our prizes uh so the three winners of our team this morning which was the energy team will be getting um a zoo lab zoom workshop in each of their classes across the world so that's a, what a fab prize that is um so yes, that's what I do. Um, I have usually take them physically take my animals out. We've got other guys that do that. But this last year, I've been doing it over Zoom. So my animals haven't had to go far. My animals have, have, have just had to do this, that's all. So they've had quite a rest, actually. So um, yeah, that's what Zoolab does. And uh, we'll be looking, we're looking forward to working more on uh, climate workshops now that we've it's going to be part of the curriculum. So that's a really exciting day for us today. Um, you know, something that we've been doing and working on anyway is now going to be in the curriculum and has to be taught. So uh, it's great stuff. But yes, I, I don't live in a cave or anything ever. <laughs> well, I have one more question. How do you feed them? What does dinner time look like? Do you feed the animals? So Oh, so dinner time is it's all varied yeah so I've got diet sheets over the wall so because I've got rats you saw my rats earlier in the week um so they have they feed on a, a, a traditional like rat feed um but they also can eat some of if I have any leftover food I might give them some of my leftover food too because I'll eat that um the tarantula the bearded dragon the frog they all eat insects um so I have to get what I call live food. So that's things like crickets and locusts. I have some of those in a tank. I have to feed them too, 
because if I try and feed the frogs and um, the other animals those and they've not been fed, then there's not much nutrients in them to then pass down the food chain. So it's important that they're well fed and hydrated as well. Um, and then I've got things like stick insects that feed on bramble. So I need to go over, walk across the fields and get some bramble every, every day or every couple of days. Um, and then I've got snakes, of course, and snakes feed on uh, mice. Um, so yeah, I feed them on mice. So I've got a, a big variety of uh, diets, but the snakes only get fed once a week. They're not uh, daily feeders. Uh, so Friday night is normally feed night for the snakes. So that's tonight. Uh, so they can then rest having a full stomach over the weekend. They can then rest over the weekend. Uh, so, so yeah, lots of different uh, diet sheets to think about, but I've been doing it such a long time now that it's, it's kind of there now, you know, so it's, it's all good. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your hard work ever that. as well. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Have you been instrumental in helping us project yes. the voices of young people around the world via Zoom? So your amazing technical talents and skills have been valuable to us. And thank you, Alex, who's joining us as well for the wonderful videos that he filmed. Um, he's an yes, intern with us at the moment at the Trust for Sustainable Living and is sharing his videography skills to help us bring more education workshops and education videos out to our schools and our young people. So thank you very much, Alex, as well. And thank you, Lalente, for joining us again. Oh, we got some music from Eva. <laughs> <laughs> I am live on Instagram, so my phone just rang. <laughs> ah, okay. Fantastic. Fabulous. Well, wow. well thank you very much for awesome. having us, Georgie. It's been wonderful to collaborate with you. I look forward yes. to seeing you again and seeing how we can get more people uh, knowledgeable about climate and get yes. more young people involved in the conversation. So let's keep definitely. working on that. Yes, we will, definitely. Oh, going to have a rest now, I think, but uh, they're back to, <laughs> back to working on and uh, educating our, our younger generation on climate back to next week. So I uh, look forward to that. Yes. Yeah, so, but thanks very much, guys. Thank you, Lilante. Been amazing. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, thanks, Eva. Everyone. Thank you, Bye. Kirsty. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. This, this today is November 5, and this was the workshop after the big event of Kids Climate Cup through Zoom with CSL and Zoo Lab. Hope to see you at another at other events. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.